me. When she got to Pasco that night, she thought, well, I'll, I'll just call Camp Hanford and see if they can tell me where Bill was transferred to. So uh, when when she called, well, the guy answered the phone and she said, uh, I wonder if you could tell me where, uh, where Bill Carpenter was transferred to. And they said, well, hang on a minute. In just a minute, I answered the phone. I was there. I was within 20 miles of her, and didn't either one of us know it. And uh, so, anyway, they came pick me up, and uh, and we had a good time. Uh, but I couldn't live off I couldn't live off post at uh, at Camp Hanford because it was a it was a highly secure place. It was an atomic energy uh, station there. And uh, I'd, I had to stay in the field for 12 days, and then I'd get a three-day pass. And uh, so she stayed there at Pasco for a little while, but then since I couldn't come in and, and be with her, well, she went back to over to her folks, which was only a couple hundred miles away. Mm -hmm. So when I'd get a three-day pass, well, I'd hitchhike over there and spend that time with her and then yeah. come back. And... and uh, our first Christmas together, uh, I was uh, on uh, on post there at Camp Hanford. Was going to hitchhike over to to Sparta, and as I was going through Pasco, I walked by a jewelry store. And this uh, in this window, of this jewelry store was. Uh, or, or looking in the window of the jewelry store, I could see this big table that they had set, and it was set with with some Linux china with a pine cone design. And I, they had the bright light shining down on that stuff, and I thought that was the prettiest thing I ever seen. So I just walked in there and bought that china and <laughs> took it with me, and that was her, her first Christmas present for me when when uh, we lived there at, uh, I mean, when uh, she was there at Sparta. And uh, anyway, we got through that 19 months. And uh, in October, before I was to get out of the Army in January, she was pregnant with, uh, with Eddie. And... Uh, we knew that by the time I got out, I was going to get out the 26th of January, and he was due to be born uh, about the 1st of March, we thought. Mm -hmm. Turned out it was the 31st of March, but we thought he was going to be about the 1st of March. And it was necessary to take her home. We, we felt it needed to take her home in October. So uh, I, I drove her to Roswell. And then I caught the bus, I think, back to, back up there. You brought me to Artesia. Yeah, I brought her to, to Artesia, to Mama's, to my mother's house. <clears throat> and uh, then when I got out, I got out of the Army then in January, 26, she was due to have that baby pretty, pretty quick, and I didn't have a job, mm -hmm. didn't have any money. And didn't have any insurance. So I got a job delivering freight in Roswell at Hill Freight Lines in the daytime and was a floor bouncer in the Scottish nightclub at night. So we, I, I, like I say, I was working day and night. But you know, when that little fella got here, we had him paid for. Hmm. and uh, had the doctor and hospital bill paid for him. And uh, he he was born on the 31st of March, and then the 15th of April, I went to work for the Royal Police Department. Hmm. And, uh, and then I worked there for three years, about three years. And we moved, we uh, quit and went back to Oregon and worked up there a while. And then it's just been a hit and miss ever since, you know, going <laughs> here and there and everywhere else. And, 
and uh, no, came and gone now. Yeah. stayed up there about a year and came back and uh, was back to the police department again so uh, and and police work just became a career for me at that time and uh, we, we came to we came to Artesia and stayed here for 10 years working on the Artesia Police Department and we went back to Roswell and I worked at the police department a while and then went to work at the sheriff's office and uh, that's when I got into politics because when I got into the sheriff's department the sheriff's position was an elected position and I had never been involved in politics at all and uh, so I was working for a guy named Tommy Thompson. Of course, he was the politician because he had to be elected to put the position and he hired everybody else. And uh, <clears throat> after, after I worked there about uh, two years, year and a half, I guess, then Tommy went out of office and my brother Leroy ran for sheriff. And that's when I really got involved in politics because mm -hmm. I, I, I realized at that time that you had to get out there and shake hands and smile at people and and uh, babies. <laughs> put out your signs and uh, and all that stuff. A lot of work, a lot of work to it. And uh, anyway, Leroy was elected sheriff. He was sheriff for four years, and I was his chief deputy. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that four years, and uh, I ran for the for the job, and that was the first time that I had personally been involved in politics uh, as far as uh, running for office. And it was quite a quite an experience because I ran against a guy that was uh, had been chief of police up there for fourteen years, and he was very well known. I was not all that didn't I didn't realize I was all that well known and while I was in Roswell, but what I didn't take into consideration at that time, and and uh, I th I think is probably my success. I think is uh, especially in that race and probably several after that was the fact that every Saturday I was visiting for my church bus, school bus, or a church Sunday school bus route. I'd go out and, sh and knock doors and invite kiddos to come to ride the bus to church and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. And so I got to be really pretty well known uh, just visiting those kids for the, for the church bus. And I think probably that's where a lot of my success came in was uh, getting known there. And anyway, I beat that fellow 1,015 votes, and uh, which I think surprised everybody, him more than anybody else. You. And, uh, and then uh, when, when my four years as sheriff was up, and, and by the way, they didn't run anybody against me on my second term of office. And then when uh, my, my four-year term was up, we could only have two two-year terms at that time. So I did my two two-year terms, and then Tommy Thompson had, had been elected magistrate judge, and he was retiring from that position. So when he went out as magistrate judge, well, then I was going out as sheriff at the same time, so it was just natural for me to run for the magistrate judge position. Mm -hmm. And I was elected to that position. Mm -hmm. And I had a I had a had a Democrat opponent, which I'm a Democrat, so I had a I had a Democrat opponent in the primary, but I didn't have a Republican opponent in the general election that year. And then uh, I was in the office for 12, 12 years. Well, I, I worked four years, and then I retired. On my on my sheriff's retirement, and stayed out f four years, and then ran again for magistrate, and uh, stayed in a two four year terms in for for magistrate. So I was eight eight years at that time, and uh, and I, I had a Republican opponent uh, each time that I ran 
at, at that go around. Had uh, I, I had good success uh, running uh, for the magistrate job because most of my a big part of my support came from Republicans, especially the the money part of it. I, I got more contributions from Republicans than I did from Democrats because uh, <laughs> Republicans had all the money, <laughs> Democrats didn't have any, you know. But uh, anyway, I was uh, I, I had a I think pretty successful career in uh, in police work. So what what did you love about um, working in public service? Well, I like people, and, and uh, I, I was able to, I felt like I was able to serve people. Uh, I was able, as, as a police officer and a, as a sheriff, I was able to, uh, uh, I was able to kind of had my church life and my police life. I could intermingle them. I could talk to people about the Lord when, uh, when uh, I was on the job if I wanted to. Uh, I was I was uh, able to I was able to win some people to the Lord, uh, especially transporting prisoners long distances, like like I'd go to California or Florida or somewhere to pick up a prisoner, and I was able to uh, to to witness to them and be able to to win them to the Lord, and and uh, that was a I think those two jobs together was probably the highlight of, uh, of my life, Pro probably as much as anything that uh, I've done when I could put the two together. Uh, but when I got in the court, I couldn't do that. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't talk to people uh, about it because it just didn't, uh, it didn't fit, it just didn't work. So I didn't miss the, the court. The court was the best job I ever had as far as pay and and benefits were concerned, but I probably liked it as less than just about any job that I ever had. Because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, of course, I retired then in uh, 1st of January 1999. And... and uh, haven't done, haven't done anything since. Just, <laughs> Go fishing. Just do what I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about, you know, when you first got into politics, were most of the people, was being Democrat pretty common? Or were you a Democrat in a Republican area? The, uh, the Democrats were, were very much in power all up and down this Pecos Valley, mm -hmm. in in Roswell, Artesia, and Carlsbad, uh, you just didn't hear about much about Republicans. Mm -hmm. There wasn't there wasn't very many uh, people would speak up and say they were Republicans at that time because mm -hmm. because there was so many. Everybody who seemed like was a Democrat at that time. Mm -hmm. Even some of your richest people were Democrats at that time. It's just a, it's just a norm for, to mm -hmm. be a, a Democrat in this part of the world at that time. And what did it mean to be a Republican back then? If you were a Republican, what what did that mean that you believed in or valued? Well, I I, I really can't know that. I don't know that I can answer that, but because I never <laughs> never having been one, I I don't know what it meant. But I know that uh, it seemed like that they didn't have the pride. In uh, in uh, being a Republican, that we had to being a Democrat for the simple reason that they were so outnumbered that uh, they didn't <laughs> they didn't talk about it much. Yeah, and, a lot uh, of the poor people were Democrats too. What's that? A lot of the poor people were Democrats. And would you say most of the people around here were poor or working class at that time? Well, like the not most of them probably, but the. There's a lot of Roswell that is a poor part of town. There's Mexican people that are live in the poor part of town. Mm -hmm. They're good mm -hmm. people, but they're poor. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
then some of the outlying areas like Lake Arthur, there was a lot of Democrats there and mm -hmm. they weren't wealthy people either. Mm -hmm. And what what did it mean to you to be a Democrat? What did that mean? Well, at, at, at the time there was a very, uh, it, it seemed to me like that there was a real dividing line between a Democrat and Republican because the Republicans were rich people and the Democrats were poor people. Mm -hmm. That was just, just pretty much the normal mm -hmm. thing. To, to mm -hmm. Republican was a rich man's party, Democrat, poor man's party. That's, that's the way, uh, I, I think that one of the things the, the uh, Democratic uh, people were, ne nearly all of your Hispanic people were Democrats. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I never failed, even when I was running against a Hispanic person, I never failed to carry the, 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 the Hispanic vote. Mm -hmm. The Hispanic people was my strength. They were always the, the strength of my campaigns. Was mm -hmm. uh, I could always count on the, the Hispanic people to support me. <clears throat> and one of them asked me one time, he said, uh, he said, Bill, do you, do you know why you always got the support of the Mexican people? And I said, no, I don't really, can't really say that I know why I did that. I always appreciated it, but I never did really know why. He said it was because you never forgot where you come from. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, he said, a lot of these uh, Mexican people around here remember you when you was picking cotton and chopping cotton and stuff like that as a kid on these farms said people remember that mm -hmm. and he said that's why they supported you and voted for you mm -hmm. so and I, I always uh, enjoyed the support of those people and and i could most a lot of them i can go to their house right today and be very received very well because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that now this part of the country is so Republican? What do you think has changed? Is it because there's more money here now? Or what do you think? Well, uh, the Republicans have put on a better campaign uh, than the Democrats have, for one thing. Uh, <clears throat> back when Nixon, this, this part of the world went for Nixon, and uh, it, it made... Uh, it made uh, Lyndon Johnson, and we had a state senator here at that time named Little Joe Montoya. Mm -hmm. They were really mad at the Pecos Valley because we went for the the people here went for Nixon that year. And if you remember that when when Johnson was in there was when Vietnam was so strong, and. Uh, <clears throat> When, when they went for Nixon as strong as they did, that, that's when Little Joe Montoya and Richard Nick, or uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson closed Walker Air Force Base at Roswell. They closed right. that because the people voted for Richard Nixon. And, uh, and, and that was one of the reasons that this country went as uh, strong as it did, but, but uh, it's the it's the fact that the that the Republicans really got busy and put together a program. Mm -hmm. They've still got a program going. Mm -hmm. It's that's uh, awfully hard for a Democrat to beat, and and it's it's simply negative campaigning. They can talk dirty about you better than anybody in the world. Whether there's anything there or not, they'll put something there. If there's not something there, they'll put it there. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, they're, they're just dirty politics. That's what it amounts to, and and that's what that's what I think has has brought them as far as they mm -hmm. look at look at what just happened. The eight years that Bush was in there with uh, with Cheney, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that was as uh, uh, low down a bunch as we've ever had in office. But but. Uh, we're going to have a hard time beating them this next campaign coming up mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. people forget awful quick. Yeah, yeah. 
And how much do you think that the oil industry and the way that, you know, traditionally Republicans have supported subsidies and, and tax loopholes and things like that for the oil industry, how much do you think that affects? It, it has a lot to do with it. But in the first place, that's, that's where a big percentage of your money is at, mm -hmm. is in oil, and, and those people have it and they're going to spend it for themselves, for the Republican Party. Uh, it's just like uh, trying to get this health care thing through right now. In my opinion, uh, we're fighting that insurance, the insurance people. Well, the insurance people own probably half to two-thirds of the money in the world mm -hmm. is owned by insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that tells you that They've got a they've got a big interest in the in the oil people and the oil companies. The insurance companies own so much, and it's just pretty hard to buck that. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to fight that. And I don't know if they're ever going to get the, the the health reform thing in or not. For that simple reason, we just uh, I don't think they got the money to fight it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, how did you feel about the whole, you know, the Wall Street bailout and all of that? How, I mean, I know that was a really tough... Just one Republican taking care of another one. Yeah. That's what it amounts to. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they, they say Obama was in office and, and uh, it's been actually his fault, but <laughs> he didn't have his hands on that money. He didn't have control of that money. Those insurance companies had control of that money, and they own those banks, and they they take care of their own. Mm -hmm. That's what it amounts to. Mm -hmm. the Republican people take care of their own. Right here in this part of the world, if you're a Republican and elected to office, if you don't do what you're told, you don't stay in there. Yeah. They won't support you. Mm -hmm. They won't support their own people if they don't get in line and behave themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've got a tight control over their people. Yeah. Being a Democrat, I do what I want to. And if they want to kick me out, they're going to get the people to kick me out. They can't do it. Mm -hmm. The Republican, I mean, the Democratic Party cannot put me out of office. Mm -hmm. Now they they can probably get out there and campaign against me and keep me from getting elected, mm -hmm. but they don't tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And and. That, that's one of the things that the, that the Democrats have always been, uh, they, they've been their own man. They haven't been bought and paid for, mm -hmm. as a general rule. And do you, think, do you think that's still true today in Congress, or do you think that there's starting to be corruption happening in the Democratic Party nationally in ways that are... Um, you know that could that could have some serious ramifications. I think I think if you went to Washington, if there was some way that you could prove the the honest ones from the dishonest ones, I think you'd be surprised at how few honest people are up there. Mm -hmm. uh, they go up there as. Uh, nearly paupers and come out millionaires and, and they don't do that honestly, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I don't. I think it's just as much one party as the other. I don't. Yeah. And do you think what they're supporting is different? That, that, they're, that they're both corrupt but they're supporting different things? Or do you think that they're, they're pretty much trying to get the same policies through which are all corrupt? I don't, I don't know that they're trying to get the same causes through, but uh, I, I think I, I don't think there's a way in the world you can get people, uh, the two parties together. I don't, I don't think there's a way in the world you can get that done. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can have a true bipartisan effort up there. And do you think that's different today than it used to be? 
Or do you think it's I always think it's been stronger that way? today than it's, than it's ever been. I think the Republicans are stronger. They are. They hate the Democrats almost as bad as they do the the communist. Mm -hmm. You they, they they think you you would think sometimes that that they think that the Democrats are the enemy mm -hmm. rather than the other party. And why do you think that is? Why do you think it's so strong? Money, yeah. power. I think that's exactly what it is. Money and power. Yeah. And why do you think Democrats have been so unsuccessful at at making that distinction for the American people? Because certainly in the Southern United States, if if you're white and you're working class, for the most part, you think the Republican Party is the party that's working for the people. Because because the Democratic Party don't have the the uh, powerful people mm -hmm. in positions to lead them. Mm -hmm. Since Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton and his wife are the only two people that we've had in years that were strong enough mm -hmm. to get anything done for the Republic for the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, I, I don't know of any other Democrats out there that's strong enough politically, strong enough mm -hmm. to accomplish anything. Yeah. And it's pretty lonesome up there for Bill Clinton and his wife up there, just the two of them, when, mm -hmm. with, with that kind of clout. Yeah. Nobody else has got that clout. Mm -hmm. And how do you think Obama's been handling, you know, the situation that he's inherited? I think, he, I think he's done a good job. Uh, I think he could have, have done a much, much better job had it not been for the Republicans attacking him the way they have before he ever took office. From the from day one, they've they've been fighting him tooth and nail. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he just uh, hadn't <coughs> had much of a chance. Uh, he's fighting brush fires instead of getting into the forest fires. He's had he got to put out these other little old fires before he can really get into the mm -hmm the main mm -hmm. crux of the thing. Mm -hmm. And when you look around you at your circle of friends, so like say at church, for example, do you have many friends that are Democrats or are, are they all pretty much Republicans? Most of them are Republicans. And Mo what most do they of your church, think? Yeah. Most of your church people are Republican people. Yeah. Now there are some old time Democrats still in, yeah. still in the churches. Yeah. Uh, but I, th I think the uh, <coughs> I, th I, th I feel like that the that the biggest reason for that is that the, the Republican people have have embraced that group of people yeah. more so than than anybody else, mm -hmm. and that's the strength in the the of the Republican Party that that group of people is there. Their biggest strength, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what would you, what, how would you recommend Democrats? What, what strategy should national Democrats take if they want to win back the working people of America? <clears throat> I don't. <laughs> well, <laughs> if I if I could figure that out, I could probably be rich overnight. You know. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't know. I, I. I. really feel like that. That the Democrats have got some way. They. The Democrats have got to let uh, the world know that they're Christians too. Mm -hmm. You know, God's not a Republican. God's not a Democrat. God can't stoop low enough to be in either party. But we can all uh, be a good Christian man or woman and, and still be a good Democrat or Republican. You know, when I was in the court, my... One of my opponents was a, not opponents, one of my judge partners was a Republican. 
And somebody, one of the other Republicans said, how, how do you get along with that Democrat down there? And he said, uh, he said, let me tell you, he said, that Democrat down there is more conservative than I am. He said, there's only one thing wrong with that guy. One is he's a Democrat. The other is he's a Baptist. He said, it's the only two things wrong with that guy. Well, he's a Methodist, so. <laughs> but but the, the, the people have got to know that that God loves all of us on both sides. It's not it's not just a, it's just not a Republican or, or a Democrat. Uh, they they don't have they're they're not the only ones got God's ear. The, the Republican not the only ones got God's ear. Uh, we've got we've got to do that, and then we've got to start out with our kids and let make them proud to be a Democrat. And, and, and I'll tell you something else. You go into your schools and your teachers that are Republican or spouting that stuff to those kids every day, every day, every day. And when they grow up in the schoolroom being taught, then all of a sudden the, the kids are kind of, they don't want to be known as, as Democrats because those other kids, the more popular kids are Republicans and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And, and it, it, it hurts the, it hurts the children, uh, the school kids to, to be brought up in that. It, it just needs, to, it, they need, the politics need to be taken out of schools. I really believe that politics mm -hmm. need to be taken out of schools. And, and, uh, I don't think it's going to happen, but it needs to happen because they're they're interfering in a in a kid's life, and uh, you know those politicians they'll they'll go to the schools and visit with the kids and that kind of stuff and ball games. Hmm. And once uh, once those Republicans get in power. They continuously get involved in the schools. We, we had one here that in Roswell, and uh, actually he come down in this part of the country too, I think, old Dan Foley. Uh, he was a boy. He was a, a bitter Republican, bitter to Democrats. He he just hated that. Uh, Bill Richardson, our Democrat governor, and and yet you could go to the ball games, all of the ball games, and every kid on that ball team knew old Dan Foley, and every one of them would, was his buddies. You know, he'd go around and shake their hands, and he'd haul them to ball games, and all of this kind of stuff. He just one of them, and uh, that kind of stuff beats you in a, at the polls. That that kind of stuff will beat you. I don't know that 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 has any come close to answering your question as to <laughs> how to turn it around, but it, it it's got to be it's got to be turned around uh, from the ground up. It's, yeah. it, it can't start at the top. It's got to yeah. start at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this uh, just like this uh, what do they call it Tea Party mm -hmm. thing. That's just another Republican gimmick is all it is. That's just as Republican as it can be. They say it's not, but it is. It's just another program that they've got going. And they're going to come back strong this next election. Yep. Guarantee you. Yep. Well, in, in some ways, I, I wonder if the, the country hasn't been economically sound long enough that people have forgotten what it's like to really struggle and that well, that you know when thing it's when things get really rough that people remember what democrats are for see see the mm -hmm. the uh the great depression the, the republicans put us into that great depression 
and and Roosevelt, a Democrat, brought us out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that, that's how come the Democrats were so strong. Mm -hmm. when, when they came out of that Great Depression, everybody was a Democrat because the Republicans got us into that mess and everybody turned Democrat and we, get, we got out of it and then we went into World War II and then we got affluent this time. I mean, whenever them soldiers all came home and their wives had all been working in the factories and everybody was working. The, the mothers never did go home. They just kept, they stayed in the workplace and after that Second World War was over with. Mothers stayed uh, in, the, in the workforce and Dad come home and went to work, so they had two paychecks coming in, and like they the was money. buying houses and buying cars and buying stuff that they'd never been able to buy in their life. Mm -hmm. And they started getting affluent and started getting this money coming in, and and uh, they had these the big programs, these big uh, well, your Social Security and and. Uh, welfare programs and different stuff to help out these poor people. And uh, next thing you know, uh, these people that <laughs> made all this money, they're saying, well, look here, I'm having to, I'm having to pay taxes on that. And, and first thing you know, uh, you're starting to get a dividing line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The rich and the poor, mm -hmm. always been a struggle, mm -hmm. always been a fight. Mm-hmm. And what would you say to you if you could boil down what uh, what God has to say about rich and poor? What how, or how how does your how does your faith align with your politics? How do those two things come together for you? Faith and politics. I don't I don't know if they can go together at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh I, I think that uh, I think God blesses those who uh, who uh, worship Him. Who uh, uh, I think when we when we give our tithes and offerings, I think we are blessed by that probably as much as by anything else. It it, came, it comes back to us. Uh, it's kind of funny because we have uh, or had always been living from payday to payday. Uh, we always we always paid our bills before we bought groceries, mm -hmm. and uh, consequently we didn't eat as well as some people did, but we ate good enough. But then we started tithing because we felt like it was the thing to do, not because we were ever really af could afford to do it, but we felt like it was the thing that we had to do, needed to do. And it's it's it I think I think we can see where from the time we started giving our tithes and offerings that God started blessing us and uh, and things became easier, much easier for us after after that, uh, God blesses us because of the way we live our lives, not not because of what we have or what or what we give Him, but because we do what He told us to do as far as giving to Him is concerned. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I feel like that. I feel like that. Uh, we, if we will just live our lives according to the way He has laid it out for us to do, if we if we read our Bible, Bible don't say a thing in the world about Democrats or Republicans. Uh, if we'll just live according to what we're told, how we're told to live, if we'll do the things that we're told to do, I think we'll see the the blessings of God and and. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, I think until until we do, we, until we start living that way, we're not gonna we're not gonna receive the blessings of God. Mm -hmm. 
I think uh, I think a, abortion is just as wrong as it can be. I, 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 I'm totally opposed to abortion for the simple reason that it's taken a life. It's I feel like a mother has the right to take uh, to to uh, abort a baby if it's going to mean her life. I think she's got a right to self-defense. But I think that's the only reason she's got a right to do that. And and I think that that is the the one thing that's got our country in the trouble that we're in right now with God is is, is simply the, the babies that has been destroyed mm-hmm. in this country. And I really believe that. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any anything else that we can let to mm-hmm. that we that of course we you know, we've all got our things that we do that's not right, but as far as the as far as uh, having turned God against the, the United States of America, I, in my opinion, is abortion. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the, the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. And I don't think there's a way in the world we'll ever get it stopped. Mm-hmm. I don't think uh, once it got started, I don't think we can stop it. I don't mm-hmm. think we got, I don't care how many laws you pass or anything else, I just don't believe you can get it stopped. Mm-hmm. Once people get to bit in their teeth, well, <laughs> they just go. Mm-hmm. That's all there is to it. Mm-hmm. What have you got to add, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't doubt much. I, I maybe see a little different things as far as the politics is concerned, why the, why the country, this part of the country changed. Uh, I think uh, a big, big part of it is race. Uh, I know in the 60s when we had the Civil Rights Movement, well, that was when so many white Southerners turned Republican. Uh, out here, it was the Hispanics. Uh, the, the Hispanics started coming and, and uh, uh, having union jobs and and work, you know, building up their political aspirations and things like that. And I actually believe that a lot of people are uh, changed from Democrat to Republican because the Hispanics were all Democrats. Uh, now, whether that's true or not, that's just one man's opinion. Um, so far as uh, Christianity and the uh, politics. Uh, you talked about what, what, what do we think God thought about it, and uh, I think sometimes he's taught he thinks about it like he does a church at Laodicea, where he says he's going to spew them out of his mouth mm-hmm. because of the the people that proclaim Christianity and just beat the drum that they're such hard working Christians and all of this type of stuff and then just lie and lie and people know they're lying. Mm-hmm. And I just can't imagine that God can bless that, you know. And uh, I think God's looking for honest people to be in politics. And uh, I know Bill said a while ago there are probably very few, but but we need as many as we can get up there. Right. Uh, but uh, I'm, I, I'm maybe a little different than, than he is about him. He said that he didn't know there was any way to get out of it. But I think the young people in the United States are uh, a whole lot more uh, liberal and more uh, caring about other people and this type of thing that the majority of them are. If, they could, if we could just get them involved somewhere, you know. Um, now there's some that are not, you know, but uh, I think the majority of them are. Uh, and uh, and that's what I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and what do you think God and the Bible has to say about, you know, taking care of of the poor? Well, it's 
Mm-hmm. It's very plain in there that you, uh, Christ talked about the fact that the widows and orphans, you're going to have them with you, you know, and, and that it's our responsibility to, to uh, take care of them. And uh, now, I know a lot of people say, yeah, but they're not talking about social programs. They're talking about Christians individually taking care of them. But uh, what's government for? Is to take care of the people, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, without the social programs that we have that the Republicans are all trying to do away with, oh my, I don't know what this world would be like if we hadn't had Social Security. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shirley and I, if we hadn't had Medicare on this cancer deal that I've had, Mm -hmm. you know, we would just be destitute. Yeah. Because... You know, we we in no way we could afford that, and our insurance would drop us in a, it's just in a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so the social programs, uh, a lot of Republicans want to do away with them, but uh, their moms and dads don't want to do away with them. Let me tell you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And 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 how do you think? What do you think Democrats have done wrong in terms of losing so much of of the country over the last 30 years? And what do you think they need to change? Well, I think a lot of it is that the Democratic Party is so diverse. The Republican parties, they're all just just alike, practically. And the Republican Party is made up of all kinds of people, you know, and they all have different ideas and this type of thing. Mm-hmm. And different uh, cultures. Yeah, mm-hmm. there really mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. And uh, there needs to be, like Bill was talking about, some strong leaders come up in the Democratic Party that that can lead the mm-hmm. people and, and unite them. Uh, the country was pretty well united behind Obama, whatever he was elected. Mm-hmm. And if... If he had come into power at any other time in history, if he hadn't have had this terrible, terrible situations that he come into, uh, he would be doing great, I think. You know, so it'd be going along. But, but I mean, you had those Republicans that went in and, and started those wars and didn't even fund them, mm-hmm. and uh, had a trillion dollar tax break for the top. Two percent or something like that in the United States. I mean, you give money to the ones that already got money and take it away from those who don't. And uh, it's just that was a tough situation that he came into. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think, so far as the health care program was concerned, I think if he had really got involved in it at the start. And really pushed it, worked on it like he's doing right now. It'd have probably already been passed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's kind of what I think. Yeah. Now I'm gonna turn it over to you, Aunt Nona. <laughs> you got anything to add to this? Well, it sounds like they've done a pretty good job. <laughs> I just don't. I don't know very much about the political. <laughs> political end of things. Mm -hmm. That hasn't been my bailiwick. Yeah. uh, But I know that talking about helping the poor or whatever, there's a lot of stuff that that I can see that we don't do enough of Mm -hmm. for like a lot of our older people. Mm -hmm. Uh, We kind of haphazardly help them out when they're in a bind and mm-hmm. try and help them along and then when they die we feed them a big dinner mm-hmm. now that sounds ugly but it I don't mean it that way but I think we could do better in that respect mm-hmm. and uh, some of these young families they've well we've got a couple of families in our church that they both have six kids and things like that, and it makes you wonder how in the world they're going to make it. Mm-hmm. But they will. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about um, your time as the as the kitchen chef at the jail. Because well, you always tell great stories. It sounds like oh, you loved it. Well, I don't know that I've done that, but I'm back at it again. 
Oh, you are? And You're doing that, it again? It's yeah. not in the jail. Oh, not in the jail. Okay. No. Did okay. You, is that what you wanted? Yeah. Oh, tell I'm me, sorry. Tell me about being the, the chef at the jail. Well, I've said a few times that anybody can cook that same old pot of spaghetti over and over. <laughs> but it really isn't isn't all that simple. There was when we when I first went down there, it was a kinda like a profit and loss situation. Leroy and I were partners in it, you might say, and He'd buy the food and I'd cook it, and then we'd split the any money that was left from what the county paid is because they paid so much per plate mm -hmm. and that that I served. And there was a few months that first year or so that I didn't really make anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then it, it as the count up in the jail grew, why that helped it along. But, uh, of course, the, the more people we had in jail, the harder I had to work. <laughs> but it wasn't too bad. Then, um, <clears throat> after I think it was three and a half years, um, the county decided that they could pay me a wage rather than buy the groceries and whatever. But anyway, then they started paying me a salary, and, and that that helped because I knew what I was going to be making, and mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't have to worry about anybody's budget. Well, I was on a budget, but it it wasn't coming out of my pocket, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm probably not saying that just right, but that's kind of how I think about it. But we had uh, when I first went down there. The first day I was there, I had 23 people in the jail. And then when I left, there was 135. So, but that's over a 12 and a half year mm -hmm. uh, stretch. So, but I always had some of the prisoners that worked as trustees in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. That was also real nice. I didn't wash dishes. I didn't mop floors and I didn't sweep floors. and. Those kinds of things, my workers done all that for me, and it it helped a lot. Now, how did they become trustees in your kitchen? How was that? Well, they were prisoners in the jail, and they had been to court and and um, convicted. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, if if they wanted to work, then they could work for so many days off of their sentence, mm -hmm. like. Two for one? Yeah, two for one. Mm -hmm. And that really helped them a lot. Mm -hmm. And there was times that I really had some good guys working in there. Um, and there was some times that they weren't so good. But when I first started out, um, I had one lady that come in and worked on weekends for me, mm -hmm. which helped me a lot because I'd I'd have one day for home and one day for church. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, But then, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you one story. You've already heard this one, but it's one of the funny ones. But I cooked traditional holiday meals for up in for up in the jail as well as as I would at home or in your house or whatever. Mm -hmm. And one day I went to Albuquerque with Bill to a meeting he was having up there and while I was sitting there listening in, well this little lady came in and told me that she didn't think I was interested in all that stuff. Come go with me. So I went with her. And she was showing me the part of the Bernalillo, Bernalillo County Detention Center up there. First person I run into was a little guy who fed a lot of meals in, in our county. And I asked him, uh, what are you doing up here? And, uh, well, I'm getting out now. And I said, where are you going? 
Are you going back to Roswell or are you going to Hobbs? And he said, I'm going to Roswell. And he said, I want to be there for Christmas because I like your Christmas dinners. <laughs> so he left. Well, when he got to, to Roswell, well, the day before Christmas, here come Hobbs and picked him up and took him to Hobbs. So he didn't get to stay for my dinner that year, but he'd very obviously been there before. And I might add that after holiday dinners, when I'd send them up, while those prisoners up there, they'd write me notes how they'd enjoyed them and, and that sort of thing. And, I never will forget the first Easter. I sent up for breakfast on their tray. They're the round metal divided trays and they can't have anything to eat with up in the jail except a spoon. And so I sent them up a boil, hard boiled egg and it was colored. And uh, I had some green grass on one of the trays of that plate. And, had a little marshmallow chicken sitting in there, and two or three candy Easter eggs. I sent it up there for breakfast, and boy, they had a fit about that. They really appreciated that. It was <laughs> Easter morning. And uh, then uh, I always had a big Thanksgiving dinner and a big um, Christmas dinner. And any time that I could, I'd try to have a patriotic dinner on the 4th of July. I don't remember that I had as much um, luck with that. Mm -hmm. uh, it may have been a picnic lunch part of the time, I don't remember. But um, anyway, that's part of the good part. And uh, there was one day in there that... Uh, I had a couple of, it was when I first got, it hadn't been there very long, and I had two of the prisoners working in there. And I called the secretary back there for some reason, and she came back, and just as she walked in the door, those two guys locked horns, boy, they just went to fighting. Well, I didn't think anything about it. I just run over there and got in between them, and she was a, uh, we were both hollering at them to stop that right now and all that sort of thing. And of course we had to write them up and everything on that and, and nobody was hurt. But whenever I went up and talked to the sheriff, <laughs> he really chewed me out. He said, that's a good way to get yourself hurt. And, and you know, when I really thought about it afterwards, I could I could really see that, mm -hmm. but those two guys, <clears throat> uh, they respected me. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything was yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and mm -hmm. and uh, they was they really done a good job for me, mm -hmm. and uh, so I got out of that all right. <laughs> <sighs> then there was one day that I was went down in the basement. We had that fixed up with shelves all around because we'd have truckloads of food come in and, and that's where we stored it. Well, one day I was down there and there was a, a window in the wall, probably two feet square, and it went back under the porch of the apartment where the sheriff used to live and uh, got to digging around back there and I found some old onion skin copies of, of things that were about different prisoners that had been transported or whatever. And the more I looked, the more interesting it got because some of them had J. Edgar Hoover's name on them and, and different um, Texas Rangers and people like that that was involved in law enforcement. I don't know if they were transporting them or just mm -hmm. exactly what they were about, but I gathered up some of them and took them up and showed them to, to Leroy. That was when he was still there, and he had me decoupage some of them on a board for him and so that he could keep it. And it, they were just old files 
that had been put down there for lack of a better place to put them, I assume. I don't know. But anyway, it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Now, we, some people would say, you know, they're prisoners, they're in jail, and... And why, why do you care about making them a nice meal for Thanksgiving or Christmas? What what for you? Why was that? Important? Because they're people just like I am and like you mm -hmm. are, and and they like Christmas dinner, and they yeah. probably they probably got whatever kind of a little gift that the the law would allow for them to have, mm -hmm. and which isn't much in jail, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but they enjoy a good piece of pie or whatever, just just like all the rest of us do. And all of them have never received a meal like that in their life. Probably not, because it was... It never, never, never had had a meal like that, because mm -hmm. it, it, it was so poor they couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were made like two or three generations of welfare people, you know, mm -hmm. and they'd never, uh, they'd just never been treated like that. Mm -hmm. She got a big kick out of treating them that way because it was uh, it was just the thing to do. What it mm -hmm. amounted to. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> just like I was telling you earlier, there was the one year that that I had this guy working in the kitchen and he helped me make the pies for up in the jail and and we made fifty two pies the day before Christmas so that they there'd be enough for them to have plenty for their noon meal and they, there'd be enough left for their evening meal that night. And if if I can eat that way at home, you know, if it's a holiday to me there, it's probably a holiday to them upstairs. And that don't mean they should have everything that, that uh, we want at home. They can't have it up there. There's too, too many things that they could hurt somebody with and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But... Um, as long as, and the, and them working, the ones that could and wanted to work, that's told me that they had a little more get up and get than some of the others who were just piling up there in the bed uh, all day and doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, there was... Oh, I had a lot of different ones that worked in there. I think three was the most I had working at one time, other than when a truck had come in loaded. And then I'd usually have about 12 down mm -hmm. down there unloading that truck and getting my shelf stocked in the basement. Now, one time, we unloaded the truck, and and I got off work and went home, and and the phone rang in a little bit, and they said, you better come back down here. And I said, what's the matter? Well, you got a problem in the kitchen. I said, what's the matter? One of your trustees got into your extracts, vanilla and that sort of thing, and he's drunker than a skunk. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was quite an experience. <laughs> And he was a good worker, and he he was one that you could depend on him to be neat and clean about himself and things so that, you know, you didn't mind him being in the kitchen with you. But, of course, he didn't get to stay long. Not that time, anyway. But And so many times those guys are just repeat offenders. You know? yeah. Some of them are dopers, and some of them are... Well, just whatever. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we we found out too. Uh, a lot of times, uh, if you treat those prisoners right, they know whether you're treating them right or not. They sure do. And and it has paid off so many times, uh, just by being decent to them and and mm -hmm. treating them the way that uh, they should be treated. Uh, we had a we had a attempted jailbreak one time. Uh, the prisoners, the jailer opened the door for some reason and the prisoners inside the jail reached and grabbed him and jerked him into jail to, was going to use him as a hostage. And two of those trustees were standing there and they just reached and grabbed him and jerked him back out and slammed the door. Mm -hmm. Well, they saved us a bad situation by doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's simply because they've been treated right and treated decent. and. Uh, mm -hmm. 
and uh, most of the time, if you treat people right, well, mm -hmm. it'll it'll come back to you some way. How often did you see people people coming through the court system that that weren't poor? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> quite a quite often. Most of it was traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, because they thought they were above the law, you know, and they could drive any way they wanted to. Uh, but we had uh, we had some uh, some of the wealthier people that were involved in some drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, those drugs don't care how much money you got. You know, mm -hmm. if you get on that stuff, well, it's a uh, it, it's a bad scene. Uh, We've had some uh, some rich folks that was involved in killings and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but nothing compared to to what uh, you've got with the uh, with your petty thievery and burglaries and stuff like that. That's usually your down and mm -hmm. out people that don't have anything and they're just simply trying to trying to get something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. trying to get it the easy way. They don't want to have to work for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and did you did you ever have any political pressures on you to treat people with money differently, or did you, know, you I feel never, I, I never yeah. did have? That's good. I never did have. Uh, I think maybe one of the reasons I didn't have was uh, there was a case one time when Leroy, my brother, was sheriff, that uh, one of the lawyers. Uh, tried to put some pressure on Leroy and uh, he found out right quick that that wasn't going to work because mm -hmm. uh, Leroy didn't pressure. So he was going to, he was going to whip Leroy. He's going to whip the sheriff because he didn't do what he wanted him to do, you know. And uh, Leroy told him, he said, well, come on, you know, just come on and do it if you want, if you want it to do. If you want to do it, if you want to whip me, just come on and do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, hung up the phone and was was waiting on him, waiting on the lawyer to get there. And the, and the lawyer actually got in his car and started. And pretty soon the phone rang, Leroy's phone rang, and the, and the guy said, uh, Hell, he said, I'm smarter than that. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to be out there. He said, Forget it. He said, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and, and you know you, you you get a reputation in a hurry by mm -hmm. stuff like that they know you're not going to once you once you set the uh, story straight why well, they they know it, they're not going to mm -hmm. be able to do that so mm -hmm. I never had any kind of pressure put on me in that respect mm -hmm. at all that's good how about the, the difference between the attorneys that, that the wealthy had and the attorneys that the poor had? Did you see a, a difference in quality? You know, I, I, I don't know that I can say you've, you've got, uh, as a general rule, you've got, uh, if, if a man's wealthy, he's got his, he's got his lawyer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and and they take these corporate lawyers, the corporate lawyers go to court with them and and uh, try to try to work their case for them. But if it goes to if it goes right down to to a trial, I don't want some corporate lawyer mm -hmm. defending me in court. And, and the poor people use the public defender and people like that. And those guys are much better lawyers in the criminal court than, the, than your corporate lawyers are. Mm -hmm. So so in a lot of respects, your poor people are better represented than your, than your wealthy people are because they simply got a better lawyer. Mm -hmm. Because they, they're in the courtroom every day. Right. And they know how to work the, the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I'm almost out of questions. Can you believe it? <laughs> If we if we had hours to go and hours of more tape, I'd ask for more. I'd ask for the you know the fun stories, the stories about rattlesnakes and guns and. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, but maybe we'll have to save it, that it, one for you the know, next one. You, if you want to end this on a on a good a good note, let me tell you, my name now is Trapper Bill. <laughs> I've gone into the trapping business. I've caught five skunks at my house <laughs> in the go. last two or three months. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Have have they gotten you? Huh? No. No, they haven't gotten you. You scared of <laughs> them. They, uh, and you know, I found out how to, you, you catch a skunk in a trap. How do you think you're going to get that thing out of that trap without getting, getting got? <laughs> I don't know. Well, let me tell you how they do it. They just get a blanket and hold that blanket in front of them. And walk right up to that cage, and just lay that blanket right over that, over that trap. Got to hold the handle, pick it up, take it over, and put it in their car, in their wow, in their truck. Yeah. Wow. They say that if you move that blanket and walk up there, that they'll spray you. But as long as that blanket's there, they can't wow. tell what you are. Wow. That they won't do it. Wow, so you're a pro now. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I I found out too that I, I can throw a slice of whole wheat bread up in that trap, and I didn't I didn't waste one slice of bread. I caught a skunk with every slice of bread I threw in there. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and that was a mama and her four babies. Wow! Wow! <laughs> Well, you but know, this I, was over a period of time, so they were adolescent size at least. Yeah. Wow. 